Welcome everyone to Nutrition and Exercise Research Day. I am Japna Dhillon, Assistant Professor in Nutrition and Exercise Physiology, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Joanne Slavin. Dr. Slavin is a world-renowned professor in the Department of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with an outstanding record of academic achievements. She has BS, MS, and PhD degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is a registered dietitian. Her research contributions have spanned over four decades and have encompassed a wide range of topics, including dietary fiber, whole grains, protein, snacking, sustainable agriculture, and the role of diet in disease prevention. Dr. Slavin is a recognized expert in the nutrition field, having co-authored and authored over 350 scientific articles with the help of her graduate students and giving more than 350 scientific presentations worldwide. She's also served as a member of the 2010 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and is a member of various scientific societies in our field. Her passion for science communication has made her a valued scientific communicator for the Institute of Food Technologists. And she's also a dedicated educator teaching advanced human nutrition, a writing intensive upper level course that has inspired and trained many students in the field. And her commitment to excellence extends beyond her academic career as she continues to manage her family's dairy farm in Walworth, Wisconsin. With her vast knowledge and experience, we are thrilled to hear her speak about the science of snacking. Her talk entitled, Understanding the Links Between Snacking, Dietary Quality, and Health Outcomes, Snacking Does Not Make You a Bad Person, promises to be informative, insightful, and inspiring. So without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Joanne Slavin. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. This is a huge honor. When I saw the list of the 56 other years you guys have had this, some of the most famous people that I've been lucky to run into, I never thought I'd be in the same room and on the list of them. So thank you for inviting me. I wanna start by saying that I'm only as good as my partners in crime and those are my graduate students and my undergrads. So, uh, this whole topic of snacking really is not my idea. Uh, it came together with a team, but I really wanna give a lot of credit to Julie Hess, who's listed here. Um, Julie was one of my grad students and is now up at USDA Grand Forks. Um, and without her, this would not exist. So I said, I'm gonna list you, do you wanna come give it? And she said, no, you go ahead. But uh, uh, you already heard too much about me. Everything is already there. Um, so. That is me with my animal long ago. Competing interests. It's so nice to talk to people and that don't have this list of a million people. I have a million people that I work with and people are like, is there anybody you don't work with? And I said, no, pretty soon I'm gonna have one of those like NASCAR t-shirts or shirts. I don't, you, you know, what's it gonna cost to get here or here? Um, so I really appreciate, I go and look at my graduate students um, and the funding that we've gotten from companies, commodity groups all over the world, and it wouldn't have happened without competing interests. So here we go. Uh, we have money currently, USDA, NIH, Tayo, a fiber company, Barilla, obviously, and we have some money from the Institute on the Environment and also the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. So um, do I have any core? No. I mean, if you talk about somebody who does anything, I think fiber is my base business. So if you say fiber and you don't get my name, I'd be disappointed. I've spent my whole life moving fiber forward. So that is the big thing. But all these other areas, I've been lucky enough to have some uh, contribution to. I serve on different scientific advisory boards, Simply Good Foods, Sustainable Nutrition Scientific Board, the Quality Carbohydrate Coalitions, the New Frontiers of Nutrition, World Economic Forum, and I'm a dairy ambassador. And if you think you can uh, work with all those people that are totally different, that's how I learn the most. I like to talk to people that are completely different from me and listen to them and find out what they're telling me about. And I mentioned I have a two thirds share now of our farm in uh, Slave and Sisters Farm in 119 acres in Walworth, Wisconsin. So here's the outline. Nutrition science to eat healthy. It's a long journey. What is a snack? Why do we snack? How do we define a healthy snack? Dietary guidelines for Americans, we'll get into that. Uh, nutrient profiling, how do we measure, you know, besides just nutrients that are in them? Is there a link between frequency of eating, snacking, and cardiometabolic health outcomes? And then just I'm, that there are many ways to get to the end of the line here so we can construct them in different ways to think about life stages, cultural practice, and different incomes. Um, 
I steal from people and I try to give them credit when I steal. So this is, uh, Janet King showed this once and I thought it was really useful. So I asked her permission. Can I talk about it this way? Over on the left there is the dietary reference intakes. And I always tell my students, nutrients have not gone away. That's what we do. We're nutritionists. We've got to make sure everybody gets nutrients. We've worked hard to get that solved. But if we uh, take our uh, foot off the gas, we will lose all everything we've had. So we have to start there and get there. In the middle of the dietary guidelines. So the dietary guidelines advisory committee report there, that orange from 2010, is a science report that informs the dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines are done by government agencies. They're not done by those scientists. So the scientists get together, write this report, and then they are dismissed and the government issues dietary guidelines. If you don't like them, I didn't make them, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually we had to put it on the plate, you know, because that affects policy. And like, I used to think, you know, I'm a, I'm a classically trained scientist that really wants to measure blood samples and stuff, but this affects policy. So you may think this is a very important, but it's critically important to get yourself on the plate, because if you're not on the plate, uh, you're, you're not gonna be able to sell any of your product in the US. So 1941, National Academy of Sciences began issuing the RDAs and quantity of nutrients a person needed to consume daily to ensure basic good health, proper growth and reproductive success and to prevent nutrient deficiency diseases. We've been incredibly successful. So nutrient deficiency diseases have been eliminated because we enrich grains, we fortify milk and other fortification strategies. Uh, but the reason we've been successful is because we've done those things. So it's not like nutrients don't count. They're very important. This is kind of the game changer. Uh, and you guys are, you're so young. I always love this because, you know, this stuff seemed like such a big deal at the time and you're, you weren't even around. So, but in 1977, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, led by Senator George McGovern, South Dakota, issued the Dietary Goals for Americans. This was a political document. There were no scientists called to the table, and this is what they said. The underlying premise for the work was that too much fat, too much sugar or salt can be and are linked directly to heart disease, cancer, obesity, stroke, among other killer diseases. So this is really the game changer. Hey, we have to go beyond nutrients and try to link diet to chronic disease. So what happened next is dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines are funded within the budget of the US. So they will happen every five years. Nothing else is funded. You gotta fight for everything else, but the dietary guidelines are funded. So they will happen every five years, they have to. So over time, you can look from the beginning, they haven't changed too much from the dietary goals. Basically, we went straight forward there. There are a few changes in 2005, we had a whole grains recommendation. There were some recommendations on trans fats, but in general, there haven't been major changes in the dietary uh, guidelines over time. This is basically who are the, the guys that we have to get rid of and the ones that we have to get more of. So uh, Dr. Ansel Keys is on Time Magazine, and this is really because of, you know, saturated fat and cholesterol. And if you read his work, it was very, you know, it was the Mediterranean diet. It was not get rid of saturated fat. It wasn't, uh, you know, get rid of cholesterol. It was much broader, but it, that's the way it got interpreted. So uh, if you look at the dietary guidelines, those are ones from 1980, we're still in that same point. Um, everybody says, what's it like to be on the Dietary Guidelines Committee? Like all this smoke and mirrors. And it's a pretty amazing process because it's very public and you can put in information and you really don't get, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you do have a lot of, these are jobs you have to get done. We have to update the science, right? So how do we update the science? A lot of it is systematic reviews and things that are already out there and updating what's already out there because it was updated five years ago. There's this technical report that gets issued and then the government develops the dietary guidelines. If you look over there though on the top, the dietary reference intakes cannot be ignored. You can't say, hey, we're gonna change the dietary guidelines and just, uh, we're gonna go right past the DRIs. Forget that, we don't need to worry. Every time you have a recommendation, you have to say, how does it affect nutrients? And if it cuts nutrients out of the diet, then we have to go back and, and talk that through a little bit but all of these things, but remember the dietary guidelines only use human data. They use no animal data. They use no systematic or uh, like in vitro studies. And that's different from the dietary reference intakes as far as where do we get our science? Where do we get our numbers? So this is where we are. Healthy eating pattern across the lifespan, variety, nutrient density, calories, added sugar, saturated fats, reduced sodium, same as healthier food and beverage choices, and then, you know, the healthy pattern down there. But the thing that's different is this shift from individual foods and ingredients to healthy eating patterns. 
So which even makes it more complicated. So what's a healthy eating pattern as opposed to what are healthy foods to go within that pattern? So here's the summary of that. Four nutrients of concern. And I always tell my students this every five years, these come up. These are the same four. Everyone's like, hey, have we heard this before? Yeah, we've heard this before because they're always the same. Calcium, vitamin D, potassium, fiber. Every other nutrient we get enough of if we look at the NHANES data set. So anything we're doing to make the situation worse in those, we're not making progress. We need to up those rather than and then saturated fat, 10%, trans as low as possible, added sugar, 10%, sodium, 2,300 per day, and this shipped with the dietary guidelines. Now, if you think it doesn't matter, I used to think that too, and thought, boy, these are stupid and boring. I'm really bored with this. And it's like, yeah, actually, you better stop and think a little more because they affect everything. Every government program that's out there has to go with the dietary guidelines. So if the dietary guidelines make a change, those, uh, all of those funding programs have to move ahead there. So if you look at policy, it's affected the SNAP program, the WIC program, uh, FDA with labeling, all of those things, they have to relate and uh, work, make sure that they're supporting the dietary guidelines. And then just nutrition education, the plate has to deliver that information too. So all these things have to continue to get coordinated. So here's the guidelines. They put a little bit different picture in 20, uh, the 2020s, but it's basically what we just talked about. Uh, limiting foods with too much added sugar, saturated solid fat sodium, and limiting alcoholic beverages. Now I wanted to bring this into snacking because generally there isn't, you know, if you think the dietary guidelines and how do we put this recommendation out, how's it going to relate to snacks? So I, I teaching life cycle nutrition, who gets to snack the most? A breastfed baby. Breastfed babies get to eat every two hours. So is that snacking or is that a meal time? Take it any way you want it. And then you're a toddler. You still get to snack. Yep, you should snack. We're okay with you snacking. Should adults snack? We'll talk about that later. But the thing that changed in the 2020 dietary guidelines is it used to be just ages two and above. They didn't go below two. And then all of a sudden they are doing ages two and below are in the dietary guidelines. So these are the recommendations that are in there. So for six to 12 year old babies, cheese and plain yogurt can be offered as complementary foods, which is basically snacking foods for babies. And then at the toddler age, uh, different servings of whole milk, um, yogurt, and um, also no flavored milk uh, because of the added sugar. So a lot of these recommendations, when you say, okay, we're gonna take the dietary guidelines and translate them into baby feeding recommendations, like, ugh, does this really work? Um, no, but, but those recommendations are there. We need to get calcium in, we need to get vitamin D in. And this is the other thing, if you look at the recommendations we have, and you can kind of see where I'm going here with snack foods, we gotta fill those four holes, right? So I already told you calcium, vitamin D, fiber, and potassium are the holes we have to fill. How are we gonna get there? Well, if you look at the 2015 dietary guidelines, they did a lot of things on dietary patterns and they found out that uh, dairy foods contribute 67% of the calcium, 64% of the vitamin D and 17% of the magnesium. So if we already have a hole for vitamin D and calcium, we're just gonna make ourselves a bigger hole. So here's what USDA has tried to do to accommodate different eating patterns. Because if people read this, they're like, this is really not very diverse. It's not very accepting of different eating patterns. So in the middle here, the USDA food patterns are there, a number of servings per day, but you also see a Mediterranean eating pattern. You see vegetarian, both vegan and lacto-ovo, and up on the top, the DASH eating plan. So there's quite a bit of data on the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, uh, those intervention studies that were quite successful. So it's not that different from these other dietary patterns, but trying to give people some flexibility, taking these food groups and putting them together. So some of the highlights we already talked about here, we're looking at across the life cycle, we're gonna include pregnancy, lactation, and babies in this. Um, recommendations pretty much say the same for alcohol added sugars and trying to think about uh, personal factors, cultural factors, budget. You know, that's always, it's not like they've forgotten about it, but those are things that do affect food choice and uh, doing a little more uh, in the dietary guidelines talking about that. Okay, I already told you those four nutrients of concern I'm very interested in, but I think protein is a huge problem. The average person in the US gets a ton of it because we eat mostly animal protein, right? So as we look at what needs to come into a snack, I'm gonna tell you that those four things are, but 
uh, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range for proteins is 10 to 35% of energy, which anybody else, if you talk to any other normal group of people that does math for a living, they're like, what? Is it 10 or is it 35 nutritionists? Pick your number, it can't be both. Well, it can be both. If you eat a really low calorie diet, it's 35. If you eat 1,000 calories, it's 35. If you eat 4,000 calories, then it's 10. So, you know, every diet is different depending on how many calories you need. But if you're on a low calorie diet, protein and high quality protein is really important, really important for kids and now the elderly. Since I've added to myself to that group, all of a sudden I'm pretty darn important. I might need more protein too. So this is from my book and just this idea of how much protein do you need that 0.8 you can see on the bottom there. Uh, for adults, but babies obviously need the most, you know, per unit of body weight, and then these, you know, pregnancy additional protein, and the average person in the U.S., and I think they do in Missouri too, because I look, having uh, looked at uh, what people eat in Missouri, they probably get more than enough protein, but going away from animal protein, not only does it uh, decrease the amount of protein, but also the quality of the protein. So here's the sources of protein in the diet. The purple group, of course, that's how many grams of protein. And anybody, my bodybuilders in the crowd, they know this stuff. You know, nutrition people should know this. How many grams of protein is in a serving of, of a chicken breast? A ton, right? But if you don't eat that and you say, I'm only going to get fruits and vegetables and get uh, protein, you're not going to get it. There isn't any. But you'll notice that blue group, which is the dairy group, also provides a lot of protein. Okay. Here we are in snack. He's like, why did it take her so long? Because this is the setup here that when you snack, first of all, if you're gonna snack, it's gotta have nutrients in it, right? <laughs> That's the only way we're gonna get to that. It's not like you can't snack, but it's a snack or a meal, we'll argue about that. So we know adults and children around the world consume significant energy outside of meals. So traditional meals seem to be declining, especially among adolescents and the increases in the number of daily eating occasions since the seventies. This is hard data to track. Think of the information we have. And I appreciated the talk this morning that a lot of times things we didn't realize that we wanted to, to look at, we never checked in on long ago, right? So even like water intake, how much water do people do? We don't, there's no calories in it. So why would we track it? Well, it might be important. <laughs> Can we get it? Uh, and Haynes data, why don't you guys record water? So we have it, right? So this information of when do you eat and what times a day, but a lot of like an NHANES data set where we're just looking at daily intake of nutrients, we don't have that information. So it's hard to get. So snacking, some definitions, consuming energy outside of meals um, is prevalent in adults and children in many different countries. And these are some of the studies that we looked at that found that US, Brazil, China, Mexico, France, Greece, and the United Arab immigrants all had data that snacking had been increasing. Generally, um, adults and children in the US have two to three times more eating occasions now than they did in the 70s, um, but most people do snack. <laughs> like 96% of people consume something outside of a normal meal pattern. And some data, and remember this data is uh, pretty hard to get at. And once somebody writes this number down, it gets repeated 10 times, which doesn't make it right. It just means that it's been repeated. So. Definition of a snack, we don't have it. So like, it's like all science, let's decide what it is before we study it in a million different ways and generate a million useless publications that some poor graduate students has to sort through and say, hey, this, these are all defin different definitions. What do I do? Uh, most snacks though are not nutrient dense. If they were, we wouldn't need to be so bent out of shape about them, right? If people were making good choices that were bringing nutrients together, that's good, go ahead. Um, and really dietary guidance provides no direction. So this was our first review paper that we did, and Julia's my uh, co-author, but uh, Satya is my second author, and when Satya is somebody I've worked with for many years, and she was working at Cary at the time, and she said, uh, we would like to commission an article on snacking, and so Julie, we worked on this, and you know, it was a very small grant for Julie's uh, funding, which was fabulous. So what we found, this was published in Advances in Nutrition, no consistent definition used by researchers, consumers, or dietary guides. It's just snacking. We kind of know what it is, but it's never been defined. Um, and that's why we can't change it or understand it if we don't even know what it is. So um, and we, the conclusion of that was a recommendation for nutrition policymakers to encourage specific health-promoting snacks that address nutrient insufficiencies and excesses. So... 
defining snacks. Um, this is what generally happens. And this is, you know, if you go back, I've done research for a long time and people go back and say, why didn't you do this right at the time? That's, we thought it was right. Now we can go back, you know, it's hindsight is always better than what we're doing now. We depend on the participants to define snacks. You know, like tell us what you have for breakfast and then what you had for a snack. May provide definition of snacks to people, which is always tough in dietary studies. Maybe we're leading the, the, the person and uh, diet diaries. And then we decide what a snack is, right? I'm a dietitian. This is a snack because you ate it at eight o'clock and it's an ice cream cone. So I'm putting it in the snack category. If you look to consumers, what do they say? Time of day of consumption. So that determines it's outside of three times a day eating pattern, the type of foods, I enjoyed it. It was good. So it must be a snack. Um, I, the amount, it's a little, it's not a big, it's little. So it's a snack. And where did I eat it? You know, like it's in my car. You guys, anybody snacking? I noticed nobody is. So maybe you can't eat in this room, but, uh, uh, and this, remember this is in 2003. So this is kind of the first reference of somebody trying to define snack and saying, hey, let's, let's, Rather than just ignore this and say it's bad for people, let's kind of get a scientific definition. Um, some of the other people that have published in this area, um, uh, Brian Wansink used to be at Cornell, somebody I know quite well. This is what he has group published in 2010. Snacks are small portions of packaged, inexpensive and nutrient poor foods, eating alone, short eating periods, less than 10 minutes, disposable utensils, um, lower food and nutrition quality, and standing while eating. And you're like, hmm, who says who, right? Who made you king? So uh, I wrote it in an article, so I'm the boss. So anyway, this is kind of, if you go back and look at the literature and snacking, okay, um, how do we define that? And then location, the most important determinant of snack foods eaten in a car, train, or at a desk. This is in 2003, like fruit, crisps, and yogurt, UK study. So Anyway, eating label of an eating occasion snack or meal may influence satiety, food choice, and micronutrient intake. There's some recent studies, pretty recent, 2006, that talked about this, that, you know, do you expect to feel full? When do I need a snack? Do I need a snack because I'm hungry? You know, so these types of questions. Is snacking bad for health? Well, it seems like we ought to know the answer since we told people it's bad, right? Don't do it hard to study that when we don't have a definition of snacking. We don't have any consistent way of looking at our data. So effective eating frequency on weight remains poorly understood, may depend on the motivation to snack. You know, why am I snacking? Um, snacking is associated with weight maintenance, weight gain, high dietary quality, and low diet. I mean, this is the point. What, when you go through and look at the studies, you get stuff all over the place. And there seems to be some differences if someone has a higher BMI versus a lower BMI, but it's very inconsistent. This is a 2015 study. Um, and this, these are all the things we really don't know with the, the research we have. Are people consuming more calories because they're eating more frequently? And if you look at the Ann Haynes data set, the more eating occasions, the more calories people consume. So that data is pretty good for the Ann Haynes data set. So if you eat, so that would say, well, let's eat once a day, but most of the data, you heard some of it today too about when we should eat and you know uh, when we should exercise. It's very hard to get that information from that. Um, and then eating occasions outside of meals need to be defined as snacks, but it does seem to be like it's around the world. It's not just a US problem. Um, we got invited to a carbohydrate conference to talk about snacks. So that what I'm gonna talk about now is mostly on the carbohydrate side. Generally, carbohydrates are what people snack on. When people think of a snack, it's generally when they describe it, fruit, uh, sweetened beverages, salty snacks, and desserts, candy. Most, that's the things that people would talk about. Uh, Julie pulled this article together on the popularity of different snack categories. And you would say, well, probably the self-report is uh, trumping here because people probably aren't eating that fruit. They're just telling me because they want me to believe that they're doing the right thing. And that's good. We're all good with that. But otherwise, as you go down, cookies, chips, ice cream, candy, popcorn, carbonated soft drinks, crackers, cake, milk, that most of what people consume is not going to bring those nutrients of concern into the diet. You know, they are sweets, they are um, snack foods, things you can get in a vending machine. So um, we did a, a study uh, with Dr. Rao at uh, Case Western looking at nutrient density of popular snacks. And as you, we go through this, remember, this is not my 
expertise. So we got some help uh, from Dr. Drunowski at the University of Washington to try to look at nutrient density and ways of, of uh, characterizing different foods. So the nutrient rich NRF index, which was version 10.3 of most some popular snacks that we looked at. So if you line them up, yogurt, milk, and fruit are the most nutrient dense of snacks people typically consume. Ice cream, pies and cakes, carbonated soft drinks are on the low end, right? Which isn't too surprising uh, because you know there's a lot of extra calories, a lot of extra sugar in them. So what should we tell consumers, right? So we got to move to this dietary guidance. Um, maybe we could tell people to just shift, right? So it's the same thing like an exercise. We don't expect you to change your diet, never snack again. We have no data that that would improve your life anyway, right? We, we just can't tell you that snacking is bad. We don't have any data, but if you are going to snack, there's every reason to make sure it is nutrient dense. Um, so dietary guidance and guidelines could help people. Um, and there are guidelines from several countries that caution against sweet, savory, or salty snacks, but provide few alternatives. And this was the picture that was in the dietary guidelines, I believe in 2015. Here's a high calorie snack, and this is a more nutrient dense snack. And you know, pictures help people, but still um, it may not help them that much. Um, and this is an example, we, we try to go out in different countries and see what kind of dietary guidance is out there. This is from Switzerland. Um, so in this situation, these are examples of better choices. And you can see vegetables, fruits, nuts, uh, whole foods as things that, and foods that you would normally eat. I mean, you don't need a completely different uh, food supply to, but these are just here. These are some examples of snacking foods that we would say are nutrient dense and bring together, bring along some of those nutrients that we need. All right, I'm gonna finish up on some of the more recent reviews. And I appreciated our former speaker when you look at what's out there in systematic reviews where you have thousands of papers and then you have a, only a few that really can answer the question because the studies weren't really designed to answer that question. So this is a recent article that came out in Nutrients. It was a scoping review, snacking consumption among adults in the United States. 20%, and this has been published pretty much, you know, 20 to 25% of our calories are snacks. It's huge, right? It's, if we could change that and improve it, that's, that's a game changer. That's really a big deal. So it's worth trying. They found 4,795 publications and uh, 31 met their inclusion criteria. So there's lots of people asking questions about snacks and doing research on snacks, but uh, trying to have a real definition of snacks that um, was in, even in their scoping review, uh, most of them did not make that. Um, some of the things, snacking themes, cues, motivations, diet composition and weight maintenance, things they looked at, other things like food quality, time of consumption and convenience, emerged as the characteristics of snacking, which isn't too surprising, right? That uh, people probably snack more at night and uh, they need to be convenient. And, you know, this really relates a lot to some of the research you guys are doing in this department on shift workers and pe people don't have these regular schedules. So if they work the night shift, is it breakfast or is it dinner when they get up and eat? So, you know, being realistic to people's eating patterns too is important. Um, time of day was found to influence food choice and snacks can either contribute or detract from a healthy diet. I mean, they're not naturally bad or naturally good. Um, I mean, this is a little long, but this came from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Report. And so when you're on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, you do these huge literature reviews. And uh, it's useful to just go publish those in the literature, even though anyone can go in and, and look at that document. So as these get into the referee journal, so it actually gives them a little more uh, ability for people to find them. So this was just published in Current Developments in Nutrition. There's a couple of things I wanna get over here, but uh, the, remember these is a group within the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Committee that met and they wanted to look at frequency of eating, occasion data from the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, looked at macronutrients, meal frequency relative to dietary quality. And they wanted to look at over the ages of two, and then they wanted to split up some of the gender, age, race data and income data. This was 24 hour recall data from the N. Haynes 2013-2016 uh, eating occasions. And remember a lot of times this data was never collected before. Eating occasions were defined as any ingestive events, solid food, beverage, or water that is energy yielding or non-energy yielding. And that definition has changed over time. 
you know, because it used to be water, who cares? There's no calories, right? We don't have to track it. So they were trying to track that too. And uh, the number of daily eating occasions. So diet quality was assessed with a healthy eating index. So what did they find? 28, two to 3% of meals on any given day. So three meals a day is still the common thing. 64% of people consume three meals a day. 90% consume two or three snacks on that same day. So snacking is almost as uh, prevalent as eating a meal. They didn't see huge differences when they looked at these different groups across uh, different uh, um, genders or things like that. Um, and then their conclusion, the frequency of types of eating occasion differs according to the age, race, and Hispanic origin and income. Diet quality is associated with the number of meals consumed. And this is one of the issues. It's like uh, generally if people eat fewer meals, they have lower diet quality. Um, healthy dietary patterns can be constructed in a variety of ways to suit different life stages, cultural practices, and income levels. Improved diet quality and careful consideration of nutrient density when planning meals are warranted. So, you know, they, was there anything earth? Well, snacking is quite, um, but remember they have defined snacking in their way too. So the next group that comes into the dietary guidelines, yeah, you might want to change your definition, but it, you will be able to compare and see if there've been any changes. All righty. So here's just, there's two more that I wanted to just, because there's a lot of new data coming out on snacking, which is interesting. For young children, it's pretty well accepted that young children do need snacks, right? And so those need to be healthy snacks. Systematic review, they looked at 8,000 studies, more than 8,013 that they actually got into their um, review. And um, from 13 to 38% of energy came from snack foods in kids, which is huge. I mean, the 38% on that high end, that's very high. Um, generally, associations with growth were inconclusive. And they really, you know, like there was no real relationship to any type of outcome, physiological outcome. Um, but they said, you know, how that people measured snack foods and uh, sugar sweetened beverages, limited study comparison. And then this one just came out because what happened during COVID? So everybody feels like everybody's sitting home, so they're snacking all the time. And this, they tried to look at uh, uh, snacking and anxiety during COVID pandemic. And this was a prospective cohort study. And it's very, it was just published in Appetite. It's a little hard to understand, but anxiety and snacking increased during the initial COVID lockdowns, but it is unknown whether this change in snacking persisted and is related to anxiety. And even getting this data on, you know, during COVID collecting data, it's been difficult to do that. Um, and this was in England. And then they found, a, you know, like a 25% increase in snacks per week in this. But they also talked about some of the uh, linking snacking to some other eating behaviors uh, that really haven't been studied in um, uh, research in the past. Okay, Julie, my wonderful former graduate student just published this and I think it's very useful. Understanding the link between frequency of eating and cardio metabolic health outcomes in America and Americans who snack. In general, and this is the best data we have, Americans eat five or more times per day on average. So if it's three meals a day, then they snack twice a day, if you want to do it that way. There's very little known about uh, the association between eating frequency and health. We really don't know that. Um, no consistent definition is used by researchers or consumers for snacks. And until we get past that, we, we really can't go any farther. Like we're at the end of the road here. So if, if you had a candy bar for lunch and you had it at noon, is that a meal or is that a snack? So, you know, and, and so I think most people are saying, we can't just say snacks are bad. We just have to make sure those snacks are giving us what we need. Um, solid and semi-solid dairy foods, yogurt and cheese may be more filling than milk. And for the society people that work in that area, it's pretty interesting. We have some data that uh, did something on gastric emptying um, with a fiber fortified drink compared to a real breakfast and the fiber fortified drink that it emptied much more quickly from the stomach and it had less effect on satiety. So I think the form of, rather than just saying a snack is good or bad, picking snacks that are not just beverages would uh, be uh, advantage also. All right, dietary guidance, USDA. Uh, USDA has been in the dietary guidance business since 1960. So here's the food for young children. And that's why I always tell people when I'm out, you guys are fine. You know, you can eat anything. You're, you're young, you're healthy, you'll be fine. We can't get it wrong with kids. 
Kids are growing and we must not get it wrong with kids. And USDA knew that from the beginning. So absolutely food for young children, we have to get it right. Snacking is part of that. And those snacks need to be as nutritious as possible and they need to provide the nutrients we need. Going across time, we always try to put this into a picture to bring nutrients in the basic seven in the 40s, the basic four in the 50s and 60s, and pretty much going around. Um, I kind of like the 1992. I find that most useful because carbohydrates are the bottom. You know, we can live on carbohydrates for omnivores. We don't need to eat off, high off the hog. Carbohydrates on the bottom, starches, breads, pastas, vegetables, fruits, and then you just need less and less as you go up. So I, I find that easy to, to look at. 2005 was not useful and it went away. Spent a lot of time, but it didn't stick around. So since 2011, this is our guiding uh, principle, the nutrition guideline. 2011, my plate introduced in 2011 is the most recent food guide. It shows how much of your plate should be filled with various food groups. So remember the nutrients we have to pull through, we have to get all the vitamins, minerals, proteins, uh, fiber. How are we gonna get that? We need to eat from this variety of foods. You have, you have flexibility what you want, but uh, otherwise that's what you have to get. Now, I kind of am embarrassed because our former speaker is Canadian. So this is not a hit on Canada, even though it might look like it. So, so I was up in Canada and they're like, hey, here's our 2019 food guide. So I thought, yeah, it looks a lot like the US. And they said, but what we did is we made water our drink of choice. And I'm like, hey guys, it has nothing to do with the drink. It has to do with those nutrients we have to pull through. So let's take that blue plate and put it on part of the plate. And then the, the person I was talking to, they said, well, wait a second, that is yogurt there. And I said, no, it's not, that's ranch dressing. I'm sorry, but that does not look like yogurt. It's not enough anyway, two to three servings. That's pretty lame, Canada. So I appreciate how hard it is to do these food guides, you know, that all they affect policy. So if you need people to get nutrients and you set up these, you know, all of our, our government programs with these food guides, we have to do the best we can. All righty, a couple of next steps and then some conclusions. I develop and use a consistent definition of the word snack, snacking, and snack food. I live in the whole grains world too. So we live in the same world of, okay, are whole grains good? Yeah, they're good. What's a whole grain food? Uh, it's got all the parts of the grain. Is this a whole grain food? But this is a snack food, right? It's like, wait a second. You know, like you can't get everything in nutrition, right? So if, if we're gonna say snacks are good or bad, they, they really don't have any meaning beyond what's in them and when you're eating them. So you know if they are providing the nutrients you need and they fit into your lifestyle and they're part of your family pattern, that they're, you can call them a snack or a meal. It doesn't really matter when you wanna eat your meals. I don't know about you guys, uh, uh, every time I go to Europe and uh, they start eating dinner at eight o'clock and, you know, I grew up in a dairy farm. So like, if it's after five, I did this even before I was old, if dinner's past five, it's like, are you kidding? They don't even start dinner. So for them, and you're in Europe and they're eating and drinking at midnight, is that a snack? Is that a meal? So I think a lot of it doesn't really matter. We have to be respectful of people's eating patterns and their lifestyle and their, their schedule. So it's not that important, but we need to make sure that it's practical, accessible, and balanced. So rather than just say never snack, no, they're for kids, absolutely you need to snack, but make sure you pick uh, high quality snacks. We have to get those nutrients of concern. You know, I'm in the fiber world. And if I believe in fiber and fiber intake is half what it needs to be, I say, let's fortify, right? I mean, I've been talking for 40 years and fiber intake's gone down. I can't take all the blame, but uh, you know, let's just help people along the way. If we believe that it's a, a nutrient, you know, let's, let's help them out. And it's the same thing, vitamin D, calcium. Uh, if people don't want to eat dairy products, let's think of ways to get that to the, the poorest of the people, not people like you that are educated, but people that need those for their children. So you know, rather than judge people, let's help them along the way. Um, and then we do added sugar, solid fats, we need to decrease those. Those are added calories, but they don't appear in isolation. It's not like you can go grab an added sugar and say, hey, we got that. Uh, you know, like a lot of foods that people like uh, have added sugars and they're important for food safety and other things. So, um, and then I just have to push in this high quality protein because it's every time in the, in, we're fortunate in the US that we have a great food supply. 
but we can easily get, you know, as people make other food choices that are lower quality and protein, um, we could put ourselves in a situation of malnourishing our own children just because we want to do the right thing. So it's very hard to make sure that as we're going forward, yeah, the average person gets enough protein, but anybody who's at risk, uh, poor people that protein's expensive, let's make sure we help them out. And that in snack foods, let's go fix these problems. So whole grains, fiber, vegetables, pulses, fruit, low fat dairy in our snack foods and promote those to people uh, rather than uh, just say, don't snack. This I copied word for word out of Julie and I got to give a talk at Purdue University. And it looks like you guys just steal all the Purdue's people from what I can tell. I guess there's a direct route from Purdue to the University of Missouri to go to Purdue and Mizzou, but that's great. Uh, we were, uh, I got to give a lecture on snacking there. And this was from our uh, paper that we published from that. So I just copied it word for word. Approxima, uh, appropriate definitions for snacks and snacking are urgently needed to develop dietary guidance on food selection between meals, as well as eating frequency. Snacking remains a significant source of energy in the diets of both adults and children in the US, probably 25%. So to just do nothing and say, don't snack, that's not helpful. Got to help them more than that. In addition to an evidence base on nutrients and food groups to consume, we need an evidence base to support meal timing. You know, like we're an evidence base. I mean, that's what we want to do, right? We want an evidence base. But when you look at the the, the uh, systematic reviews that are out there, you know, there's four thousand and thirty of them actually get into your evidence base. So trying to define using a consistent definition so you can actually move the science forward. Uh, if we can't agree on that, then uh, it's going to be hard to to move it forward. I, I uh, really like this, and I was going to bold it. If eating three meals per day is better than eating six meals per day, then that information should drive nutrition policy. And it really reminded me of this morning, like everybody, uh, how should I exercise? When should I exercise? And it gets out in the literature, this is the right answer. We are the experts. So what's the best answer to give people? You know, is it better to eat six or is it better to eat three? And let's, let's support that, right? And I think what we have right now is probably six doesn't do us any good, right? This idea of, and the, a lot of the research that's going on, does it affect glucose levels? Does it affect other things? We just don't have that data, but we need to work toward it because people want those answers. How many times a day should I eat? And we should be able to give them the best information we have. And without an evidence base to guide recommendations, dietary guidance in the US appears to chide consumers for eating snack foods without providing clear science-based recommendations around eating frequency and health promoting food choices that could support public health, such as foods rich in nutrients of concern. So uh, appreciate uh, working with my wonderful graduate students. And then I, uh, I show you guys some pictures. <laughs> so I really want to thank you for inviting me. I'm just so honored. I can't tell you. And I want to, uh, if, if it wasn't for people coming to me and say, hey, let's work on snacks. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I'd like to do that. So Julie, uh, my former grad student, who's now up at USDA Grand Forks and talking to some of the students, USDA really wants to get into broader nutrition and exercise. And uh, the nice thing about USDA, um, research places is you get to do full-time research. So uh, rather than teach a ton of classes, it's pretty nice gig. So uh, you might think Grand Forks is cold and it is, but it's still pretty nice. Uh, Satya, who I worked with at General Mills, and then she went to Cary. It was her idea to look into snacks. And I really appreciate that because it wasn't my idea at all. Dr. Rao, who worked with us as an MD at Case Western, Adam Drunowski that helped us with uh, the Nutrient Rich Index. And I think that's what you'll find is that people will just be thrilled if you call them and say, hey, I have a question about this. They'll help you because the, the only way research gets done is with a family. I have to uh, <laughs> promote my wonderful people in my family to my spouse, uh, Dr. Mark Engstrom, who had the best job in the country at Penn State when we graduated and he turned it down so I could take a 100% extension job in Minnesota and he could be unemployed. So his advisor was very impressed with that decision. Nice job, Joanne. It's like, so and I couldn't get a job at Penn State. So, you know, when you guys talking to the grad students at lunch, it never looks like it's going to work out, but it always does. Don't worry about it. You know, you're thinking, oh, I, what have I done? This is terrible. It always works out. I have three wonderful children, Amy married to Adam, Sarah married to Dimitri and Andy married to Shannon and my grandson, Sam, who is arriving tomorrow from Switzerland. They're moving back after three years. So that's fabulous. Um, 
I have to love UW Madison. They give me three degrees. You know, we were talking about that if I had gotten a dietetic internship, I'd still be a dietitian in Lakeland Hospital in Walworth County because I didn't know there was graduate school. I didn't know there was research. So uh, just, and you guys have the same wonderful big candy store here where you uh, get to uh, see research, be involved in research is very exciting. Uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities gave me huge opportunities, uh, so love it. Uh, but uh, usually, if you guys see me at a hockey game, I have my maroon and gold sweatshirt and my red and white coveralls because uh, I'm very uh, stuck in the middle. Wonderful graduate students. I've had more than 90 graduate students that have gone on to do wonderful things, and I appreciate them. And then my undergrads challenged me every day. I had to go back and write a couple letters tonight because they were due, so that's all good. This is uh, Julie is there with the cake. So I said, I got to find a picture of Julie. So that is the graduation. We always have a party up at, we have a cabin up in Wall, or Balsam Lake, Wisconsin. So, and it's usually in May and it's usually freezing. And so you see people have sweatshirts on. So that is Julie. And then here's the last year's party. So uh, as Marie Antoinette always says, let them eat cake. So I didn't want to leave you with that as a snacking thing, but uh, uh, there is, Every food, you know, food is such an occasion. I really appreciate you guys continuing to have this event because I think with Zoom and stuff, people think, oh, we can do everything remotely and we don't sit around and have breakfast with people and have lunch with people and, and learn things and uh, it's the only way to do it. So I, uh, University of Minnesota, we were talking on the way over that you guys are smart enough to call yourself MISU because most people think we're the University of Michigan. So if you, <laughs> so you don't have to get, uh, so. Uh, appreciate it. And those are our other places. So I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Slavin? <laughs> I always hate to be in front of bar time. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the size of the meal versus the frequency of eating, which one is the well, that's culprit good, as far as, I mean. Yeah, no, that's a good question. The size of the meal versus the frequency. Um, you know, it really hasn't been well studied. You know, that that I would have to say, but um, that that's a, that's a very interesting question. But, you know, I think the portion size is a huge difference. And in the US, if we could get around that too, that there a small, we had this wonderful lunch today with those, uh, <laughs> and th those are the right size. You know, if we would eat the right portion sizes, we wouldn't have to be so obsessive about uh, what we, you know. But I, I think that both those things are not well studied as, as far as both important. But uh, I think the variety and moderation, um, what we find is too much variety. People tend to overeat too, so. Thank you. This is a very um, personal interest question. But that was a fantastic talk. So I told you I have three kids and the first of the month, we're supposed to bring a packaged snack to school that's going to last the class for the rest of the month. And I can't figure out what is a healthy packaged snack to provide to kids that's also going to just sit in the closet for a month. Uh, I'm a dietitian too. And so my kids have always been in sports and I would, I use, this is the thing it's, you know, like when you, you know, too much, it's like, okay, just my kids would always say, just be normal, right? Don't be weird. You, you don't, don't tell them the snack, what they think is healthy is don't just cut, cut, you know, don't come in. So to me, if it's shelf stable, um, it's, they're all fine. Right. I mean, I guess that they're, what do you need? Obviously there isn't a lot of, um, uh, dairy type calcium, you know, if you, you know, so it's hard to get fiber, it's hard to get whole grains. So, um, um, what do you do? You know, you're not going to buy them all. I guess you guys are in Missouri, so you could get, uh, everybody could have meat, but you know, you're not going to do that, right. Or cheese, none of that's stable. Um, and, and if you bring cookies, you can't. <laughs> so, um, those little fish, Fruit snacks. I mean, that's kind of where you're stuck, right? I mean, what else are you going to bring? So, and and I think it's kind of unfair too to put it on the parents, right? Uh, I because it, it's it's yeah yeah. What are you going to bring? <laughs> I don't. Well, see, I do like those 
now everyone's going to know what I bring to my kids. <laughs> I can't decide because you do like the fruit roll up things and you know that those aren't good. And then you do the pretzels and you're like, well, I don't think that's, and you do the goldfish and you're like, I know that's not healthy. And then you have allergies. <laughs> now, if you bring nuts, it's like, there's somebody that has a nut allergy. So you can't do that. There's gluten problems. Can't do that. So I think it's really hard um, to, and, and to think of if there's 30 kids in the class or 25, there's a lot of them that may have cultural things where they don't eat that group of foods anyway. So it's hard to fit for, this is a group of kids that some of them just don't want the snack anyway. So yeah, it's just like listening, like high fiber, magnesium, vitamin D, calcium, <laughs> is there like the perfect? Well, the fruits that, you know, I think the potassium you can get by with some fruit snacks though, so yes. Okay. <laughs> this might be a little facetious but i was just wondering if there's any data on mental health with snacks like if you go without snack i i know some people that tend to get a little upset you know maybe towards the end of the day before that last meal or something like that so i was just wondering if uh you had any thoughts on that I think that's a fabulous question. I'm gonna tell you once, this is all of our failed research where I thought we knew the answer. So we did a study once and uh, the idea was when you do a satiety study then you leave, let people eat an unlimited lunch or pizza or anything. So in this, we fed them a high protein, high fiber pasta, and then we gave them unlimited snacks, right? And so these were, when you were talking about that, I was thinking everything that was in the vending machine. So chips, candy bars. And uh, we really thought that fiber and uh, protein would slow them down, right? So no matter, and so we had, we started with 1500 calories of snacks in this assortment and they had to eat them while they were sitting there, right? It was like two in the afternoon. You know, they shouldn't be that hungry. Uh, most people, when given a tasty snack, they just ran, they ate all, you know, whether it was the low fiber treatment or the high fiber treatment, they cleared out but then other people didn't eat any snacks at all. Like they just like, I don't like snacks, but then other people would clear out 1500 calories. And we, you know, you're not in those types of studies, you're always supposed to have excess. So you can say they ate till they were full and those people, yeah. So I, I think for a lot of people, um, we were just laughing to my son had this friend Christian that would come over. Two things that killed me about Christian. The first time I was making cookies and he said, I didn't know you can make cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first thing about Christian. I thought, yeah, you can, you can make them. And then, you know, he said, I thought you just got them at the store. It's like, no, but every time he would come over, he would say, I need a snack. And then Andy said, the reason he would do that, because at his house, he, they, you weren't allowed to have a snack. And he knew that he was going to get one out of me. So as soon as he walked in the door, I need a snack. So this, but I, I think that the thinking for people, it really is comforting, you know, like in a lot of cop, you know, uh, coffee, things like that uh, at two o'clock, people need that. And we keep their day going. So I think that the, well, you know, the gut brain axis in the fiber world is alive and well. So I, I would agree with that. Amazing talk. Thank you. Um, think, can you talk a little bit about how evidence that was published in our regional paper, how long it takes in the process to get to the entire guideline? So I'd like to know your perspective on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we were just talking about the differences in access to data too. So I, I have published some papers long ago that are stuck in a library and that nobody have ever seen. And I go back and look at them and, and the dietary guidelines, you know, it's supposed to build on every five years. So there's a lot of, and the, the questions over time have changed. So the year I was on, there was a lot of interest in probiotics and prebiotics. And the decision was, we can't get into that, right? We have too many things to do. So they're always get, moving things off the agenda. And right now, the, the big interest has been sustainability. So trying to bring some of those metrics in. So I think that the committee, um, and it's changed over time, because then this is politics that this year, uh, the committee really wasn't allowed to re kind of rework the questions and they were given to them by the government. And like, these will be the questions you do and they pretty much have already been done. So how far back would you go? And you're making the assumption that the last committee covered it. So they will generally only go back for the five years past that. Now people can send in new information. If you have a published, you know, we talked about preprints and getting new information to them that you think is important, you can send that to them. But, um, you know, a lot of people, if you look at who's on the dietary guidelines committee, 
they know their area really well and they don't know other areas. So getting new information is pretty hard, but it, it's a very open process, but it's also, there's just so many topics in nutrition, it, it's hard to cover everything, but you can send things in. I mean, it's an open act. You know, so if you have an article, you say, hey, you should look at this. This is, because there are some studies, that, you know, we talked about the, the studies in Minnesota, the starvation studies that were done you know, they were published a oh, hundred years ago. There, it's still the classic studies. That's the best information we have. So just because something's old doesn't mean we, we shouldn't go use that information. So going off that question, uh, when you're formulating the dietary guidelines for Americans, how do you take into account different cultural practices across the U.S.? Yeah, no, that's a huge issue because uh, people don't know about it. So, you know, when I was on the dietary guidelines, um, Look around who's in the room, uh, white, uh, uh, a few women, what's the expertise? At the time, there were like three dietitians, um, mostly public health people, that, um, and one other food science person. So I was like, everybody would say, well, you're the food science person. I'm like, I'm in a food science department. I'm not that strong in that. So I think you have even, you know, they've expanded the committee. I was 13 when I was in, I think it's 18, you know, it's gotten bigger, but to have all that expertise and especially a lot of times like dairy products, low fat dairy, there's a lot of cultures that don't consume that. They might consume cheese or yogurt. So to find out what those cultural practices are, if you think dairy is the only way to get those nutrients into their diet, then think that through farther. Rather, and I think they, they're trying. And I, you, if you look at some of the new recommendations, they say they're going to look at it, but it's, you, you don't know, you know uh, when you don't know, right? And every state is different you know, and, and every culture is different. So uh, you know, it's hard to get all of that done. That's really nice talk. Um, probably 15 years ago, I kept getting to review papers that compared three meals a day versus six meals a day. And the most famous person of this is a person named Farishi. And what, what I learned from the other reviewer as we were reviewing this is that when you look at food records, the more meals per day, as you said, the more opportunities to overeat. So if you tell patients to eat multiple small meals per day, they overeat. In these papers that we were reviewing, they took the person's total daily energy needs capped it, divided it by six, and fed it to people. So if you don't overeat, it looks like multiple meals per day is healthy in a research setting where you can control people's food intake. Does this, so- And what would be the, like Elizabeth, what were their good endpoints too? Is yeah, it was great. Glucose is 10% lower in blood. Um, it, it was just very compelling. But then the, the other reviewer said, look at the NHANES, look at number of meals per day. And that correlates very clearly with greater food intake. And we also know the more meal, the more food is consumed at night, the greater the food intake over needs. So to me, the issue of snacking and that we don't have a definition seems to be the, you know, kind of the biggest stumbling block because your snack needs to fit in your total daily calories, not add to your total daily calories. Well, and I also think just back in the day, like when we were children, you could only eat at an eating occasion. You could not snack. It was not allowed, right? <laughs> you would not, you know, and uh, Ellen Satter is this woman who's written quite a few books, both a social worker and her thing is don't be a short order cook for your family. Make sure that, you know, it's the, the meal is, and if you can live on bread and milk, I don't care if you don't eat, <laughs> this is the menu. How do you, you know, how do you teach kids to eat and learn how to eat vegetables and other foods. This is the meal we're going to eat here. Um, and uh, if you don't want it, that's fine. Have a glass of milk and bread. You're not going to starve, you know, and you could let last for months on that. So I'm not going to worry about you, but I think we've allowed snacking. And then what happens is people snack and then they don't eat the dinner and people get upset, but you know, and you guys, uh, um, people that have uh, tried to combine a, uh, uh, having kids and, and a professional career too, is that most of the time you are eating in the car, not that you want to eat in the car, but you're stuck in traffic. So, you know, there's the ideal thing. This is what we'd like and, and let's help people out and not make them feel guilty too. So, but I think that would be good for that data if, to even give that to people, because I, I don't think it always goes back to the NHANES data shows the more times you eat, you eat more calories. Yet Weight Watchers 
a pillar of weight loss is multiple small meals, always carrying something so that when someone offers you a cookie, you have something in your bag that you can replace it with that's healthier. There are these really important tenants around having food available. And then there's real life when food is available, people just eat it. Well, it definitely was true when we did those that snacking study because they just, if they either ate no snacks or they just ate 1500 calories in snacks. And they didn't, you know, we said, you can't take them. You have to eat them here, but just eat until you're full. And they never got full. So. <laughs> All right, we are time. So thank, let's give Dr. Slavin a warm round of applause. I, I want to say too, it was so nice to have this topic. I loved listening to the snacking this morning. It was wonderful. So, you know, to actually have a theme and bring it together like this, I appreciate that. It was fun. No, thank you to both our speakers. We're really fortunate that you could be here today. And for those of you who will be at the banquet later this evening, uh, well, yeah, there'll be plenty of appetizers, snacks, I'm <laughs> assuming, followed by dinner and maybe another snack comprising of dessert. Yeah, yeah, we'll have uh, some exercise snacks thrown in there, taking some stairs. So yes, yes, so we're learning, you see, we're, everybody's learning. But um, the speakers will be there and you'll have uh, an opportunity to ask them more questions. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for a very successful nerd. <laughs>